Hey everyone, welcome. So glad to see so many of you today who've shown up to hear from Alara D'Entremont. Did I did I pronounce that with the right emphasis on the right syllable? I hope. <laughs> um, we say D'Entremont, but D'Entremont. A little less French nasally stuff going yeah. on. <laughs> well, we anyway. are French, but it's yeah, we don't quite have that accent. Not so much nasal sound. Well, anyway, we're so excited to have you here today. She's been in our community for a while now, and um, I'm just thrilled to have her with us. I went after Lara in a fangirl moment, like I'm just in love with the way you write, and I love your messaging, and you just have such a beautiful way with words, and I was like, we need this lady in our community, and so <laughs> she and I have become friends friends and um I'm just so thrilled to have her here so Lara tell us a little bit about yourself and where you live what you do your writing tell us all the things yeah um well you've seen my two kids they're about my child cares on the way in here a few minutes to <laughs> take care of them but I have three boys uh twins who are a little over two and a half and a five-year-old boy um I live in the middle of nowhere in Nova Scotia. <laughs> um, if you've ever heard of the, um, oh, you know, Halifax sends a tree to Boston every year to thank them from helping them in the explosion that happened in the Halifax Harbor. So I'm about three hours from there to oh, kind of give wow. you uh, an idea of where I am. Okay. You're way up north, north and east. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, and we're like way down at the bottom of the province surrounded by trees it's great small population <laughs> wonderful and tell us a little bit about your your writing what what kind of writing do you do do you enjoy tell us more about that yeah um so I started writing in grade two actually and it was because I was really bad at writing the teacher would assign like write a story here's a story prompt or just write a short like one page story and I couldn't do it I didn't know how it was just it was too difficult I couldn't figure it out it didn't make sense to me and so then my grade two teacher told my mom you should get her to practice at home because like obviously we don't have time in class to try to like sit here all day and figure this out get her to practice at home here's some stuff she can do and my mom was very diligent about it and that year my writing just flourished I guess you could say inside of me and I grew to love it I didn't stop writing after that and I I wrote stories for most of my school years one moment okay you go find something real life, and, um, real life happening <laughs> and um yeah I just I wrote stories for most of my school life until about grade 12 when I started writing more in a blogging kind of way I set up a WordPress blog and bought a template and got started. And, and from there, I mostly developed my article writing skills and some of my narrative writing skills and personal essays and more memoir type writing. And now I also do the fiction as well on the side. I still haven't gotten any book deals or anything. And who knows if they'll ever see the light of day, but <laughs> it's a fun thing to do when I'm feeling tired and stressed and just like, I have no writing ideas no article ideas and yeah so that's kind of where I am I do a bit of everything but it I mostly focus though on essays and articles okay well I love that you started because you weren't good at it you know and I think that gives us hope for all of us that we're all on a projection of improvement and even with kids at home too I have I have kids to that just struggle with writing and like there was something in you that really kind of wanted to get better at it and you did over the course of your life and um are bearing a lot of fruit with that right now so when um you're writing for yourself and I know that you do some you know freelance work as well but when you're writing for yourself what what is it that you most enjoy writing about When I'm writing for myself, I mostly am right now. <laughs> so when I write for myself, I 
Yeah, I write on my blog, like I said, personal essays, and I do like a lot of devotional kind of writing for places like Well Watered Women, and more like kind of like think pieces that Risen Motherhood looks for. Um, and I'm not, I've never really gotten into the more journalistic writing, but I kind of touched on that when I did a piece for Christianity Today, talking about um, some new findings in the world of Mar like home marketing and buying houses and the way people are looking at their properties and how they're styling their homes. I did a bit of it there, but for the most part, I focus on like the kind of Christian living article writing that you find in the typical Christian living books or like PGC and journey women and places like that. Okay. So today we're talking about truth, goodness, and beauty um, where, where does that fit in to your writing life? So for me, the, I've always loved the phrase of truth, beauty, and goodness. I discovered it through another blogger years ago and I did, did some research on it. I'm like, where did she just come up with these? Like she had named her blog that I'm like, how does one think of three, like these three lovely words and pair them together <laughs> to describe something. And I found out it's actually a, it was a saying way back from like, if you do classical education, like way back then with like Aristotle and Plato, they were talking about it then of this concept of the three transcendentals, uh, truth, beauty, and goodness and how everything falls into those categories and all three of them are necessary and that we need all three together. And so I started looking at my writing that way that I want to communicate truth and I want to communicate goodness and I want to do it in a beautiful way because I think all of them are essential. And I've noticed at different points in my writing career where I perhaps focused on one to the neglect of another, where mm -hmm. maybe I got so excited about the truth and teaching this theological concept or teaching this um, new biblical doctrine or exegeting a passage. But then it wasn't really beautiful. It was just kind of dry and maybe even angry and perhaps prideful even at times of, you know, angry that someone else doesn't agree with this. And like, how can people not see this in the Bible? And it just, there, was not, there wasn't any goodness there either. It was just... And it was sometimes mean spirited. And then I see other times where maybe I focused too much on the beauty to the point that it almost distorted the truth that mm. I wanted to communicate that in saying something beautiful and trying to be very metaphorical, it actually communicated something that goes against God's word. And so I realized I need all three and I need the goodness to be fueling me as I go and do the work that I'm doing what is right. I'm seeking to be just and nuanced and careful with my words, but that I am always communicating truth, even when it's scary, even when it's unpopular, but I'm striving to do so in a beautiful way that honors God and that people, it doesn't come across as angry and harsh and something that just makes them want to cringe, right? I want to make something that they can say, even if they disagree, at least, you know, they could understand the point because they weren't so bombarded by difficult language or by a mean spirit behind my words. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm going to geek out a little bit because <laughs> uh, I love that so much. Um, if you all, I, I don't know if you, if you all have heard me talk about this, but I helped found a classical school. And so this idea of truth, beauty, and goodness is so ingrained in me, and I see it so much in the word of God. And, and really, when we think about it, and I love the word transcendentals, because it's like, it does, it kind of supersedes all, all other things, right? All other virtues. And that those three are like this trinity of truth that is true about who Jesus Christ is. He is true, he is good, and he is beautiful. And so I love that, Lara, so much. I think that that's such a great application of using those transcendental virtues um, and applying them in your writing. And it is sort of like a balance, right? Like if you have mm -hmm. two, if sometimes you can be so sure that you're so right about something that the scale tips and it's no longer beautiful. It's more like a hammer, right? That you're kind of, hitting somebody over the head with. So um, 
So like, can you talk to us a little bit more about like what truth, goodness, and beauty is? Can you define those maybe a little mm-hmm. further for us? Yeah. So obviously I would define truth as truth. There is actual truth. It's not, <laughs> it's not whatever feels good to you, whatever your truth is, but there is absolute truth and it is transcendental. You know, no matter what time we're in, no matter where we are culturally or in society, there always is this basic truth of what is true. And truth comes from God first. We find this ultimate truth in God's word and even in his creation, the way he's made things. And that's truth. It's not necessarily what we feel or what we think is right, but rather what God has declared, this is right. And this is the truth. And this is the way my world works. And this is the way I have ordered it to work and instructed it as for beauty I would think of that not just in an aesthetic way of like style our home or you know what what clothes we wear or how we do our makeup we often think of these physical things as what's beautiful but rather I would say well yes those things can contribute to beauty I'd say beauty can ultimately be, be defined by what is true and good you know, if it's true, if it's good. A beautiful quote that I loved from Albert Moeller, he said, the the model who has been popped and has piles of makeup on and who really doesn't look like that picture you see on the front of the magazine, that's not beautiful. But the face of a child with Down syndrome, that is beautiful. And like that just, (laughs) if that doesn't define beauty, I mean, what beauty is. Beauty is what is true and good in this world, what is real. And that just what causes us to pause and be awed, the power and wonder of God. You know, when you're walking outside and you see this beautiful iris growing up in the muck of a pond and you say, that's beautiful. And you say, there is God. Or when you hear a bird singing out her song in the tree and that causes your heart to stir and say, look at God that he invented music, that's beautiful. Those things that cause us to pause and just be awed at the wonder of our creator, that's where beauty is. Hmm. And then as for goodness, I would think of that in the sense of with our hands and what we, our actions, you know, those things, what the truth and the beauty, what they create in us. If we are holding to the truth and if we are striving towards beauty, goodness should come out of us when we are living lives of truth and beauty. Because times I think, you know, we can get, all the time I see it in myself where I get so hung up on the truth that it becomes like that hammer that it's no longer beautiful. And honestly, it's no longer good. It might still be true, but the way we're communicating it and the damage we're doing as we communicate it is not good. So goodness is like those ethics and it's the heart, the way we're going about it, the mindset we have as we go about it. And I think that's how I would really define those three, especially when looking at um, the art of writing. I'm, I'm thinking as you're talking through that, like, can, do you think that those line up with, um, you know, in the, in the word of God, it says that we should love the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul and strength like those um when you were describing goodness you were saying it's like your acts right it's the things that you're doing with your hands that um are the the goodness is defined that way so could that correspond with loving the lord with all your strength right and um the the you know those those do those virtues line up with that do you think um, in terms of loving the Lord with all your heart, mind, heart and mind and strength, do those three kind of line up together with truth, goodness, and beauty? I think so. It makes me think of, if you've ever read C.S. Lewis's The Abolition of Man, he talks about men without chest. I think of that, it's like, we're so focused on truth that we neglect the beauty and goodness, we become like those men without chest, you know? And when he says chest, he's referring to that heart, right? That you're so focused on the mind that you've lost the heart, the soul of what you're doing and why you're doing it. You've made it this, because he talks about in the book that these writers of an English book, 
they were saying, you know, somebody looks at a waterfall and says, oh, it's so beautiful. And he's like, no, no, it's not beautiful. You just feel that it's beautiful. And what matters is the plain thought, you know, it's water and it's falling. And he's saying we're creating men without chests when we do this, that we're focusing so much on the mind that we've neglected the heart. It's so interesting. Yeah. And then, and, and that can overflow into our writing, as you said earlier, that as Christian writers, that this really should be the way that we approach writing is that it should be about truth, goodness, and beauty. So I, I love that. I wholeheartedly agree with that. It is the art and heart really, of, mm-hmm. of writing. So um, do you think that as Christian writers that maybe we tend to emphasize one over the other, or is there one that is more important than the other, other two? I think it depends. Like I notice it in certain circles, like in some circles of the Christian writing world, there are some who are, re- I often say this, I'm like, this book was really beautiful, but it was filled with so much that no, I can't recommend it which makes me so sad or then I look at a book and it's like wow this had really great truth in it but it was just so difficult to read it was it was torturous and I think I think we do because we are right that we often swing we see it in theology we see it in the trends we swing from one side to another like a pendulum rather than walking ground which we should and what yeah I think we need to remember that all three of them go together it's the three that rely on each other they're a trinity like you said Kara and we can't neglect any of them or place one more important than the other because truth yes there's ultimate truth and it's defined by God matters how we go about communicating that truth And then goodness is defined by what is true and what is beautiful. And then beauty is defined by what is true and good. We can't separate them because when we do, things are not only uneven, but things are not working right anymore. Oh, so true. I love that. Yeah, they just do connect. They they can't be separated. Cheryl said, it makes me think of Philippians 4, 8, which is true. Uh, The things that we're to be thinking on things that are good and true and beautiful, right? Like that is exactly what we're commanded to be about. And I think maybe now more than ever, like that message is needed for the church. It's needed um, for Mm -hmm. the world as well, right? Because there is so many things that can steal that joy and steal um, that focus away for us. So let's bring it like back home to the whole topic of writing so um how does this affect our writing what would you say to us in terms of like how how can we practically be people of truth goodness and beauty in our writing how does that work itself out I think ultimately it comes down to we are Oops, I think we're there's a little delay. Does everyone else hear that delay? But okay. we're taking the time, like to make sure. <laughs> Oops, okay. Yeah. You're gonna have to repeat that, Lara. I think there is a little bit of delay. And what you said, it was a little muffled. Could you repeat what you just said? Yeah. Um, Can you hear me now? Yes. There was a, yeah, your words and your video froze. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think what we need to do as writers is we need to be checking our hearts, immersing ourselves in the truth, and also taking that time to rest and experience beauty, whether it's going for a walk, you know, getting away from our screens for a bit, or reading a good and beautiful book. There's thousands of books out there, but we want to make sure we're reading the right books. And I think in a way, reading can be that ultimate place where we really harness and craft our writing to be a place of truth, beauty, and goodness. When we're reading books that are beautiful, beautifully communicating the truth, 
communicating what is good. That's where we really grow and develop as writers. Because I always tell people I attribute my growth as a writer to both editors and the books I've read. Because it's those those who have edited me and looked for, you know what, you said this in a really boring way. Or, you know what, I don't think that's what scripture says. I think you're going off track there a bit. Or, you know what, you really need to say this in a more nuanced way. Because while this is true, there are also other parts of this. There's more gray in here. You've become too, um, too zeroed in on one aspect of this issue. And so I think making sure that we're being edited by people who are at the same place as us or more mature than us who have that extra experience, who can see into our writing and see where maybe we're going too far one way or can have that biblical knowledge to be able to say, you're straying from the truth of scripture. Or you know what, this phrase, while it's true, could use some reworking so that way it's more pleasant and enjoyable for your reader. And so I'd say editing and then reading the good book. Reading good books that they're filling our minds and our hearts and that they're helping us produce something good with our hands. I think those are the most important things we can be doing as writers. And when we neglect them, it shows in a, in a hard way. <laughs> and, and really, when we do that for one another, when we are that extra set of eyes on our own words, like Lara has done this for me uh, recently, where she looks at my words and we, we can be so close to it. We don't we don't see what other people are seeing from an outside perspective, but it does. It's like speaking the truth in love, right? Like that is what a gift that we have with each other that we can be like, no, I think you need, you're a little off track here or, or it, it could be perceived that way. And so that's just another way to speak truth in, in a, in a pleasant way to somebody to help them improve in their own, in their own writing. So I love that. So, I mean, can we apply truth, goodness, and beauty in things like our SEO, (laughs) our web design, our graphics, like, or is that like too base, too banal for something so transcendental? Like, can, can this apply to, to those things as well? Do you think? I think so. I mean, I'm sure many of you have heard Janice talk about how We often think things like SEO, it's just, it's this really formulaic and boring way of writing. But like she said, SEO wants to see good writing because good writing ultimately is what keeps people on the page. And that's what the SEO algorithm wants. So I think it does matter. And I think it also, you know, the more physical element of beauty, we do want our website to be aesthetically pleasing and user-friendly. That's the goodness, right? When mm-hmm. we've created something that's super clunky and irritating to use, and like I think of websites that I've been on that a pop up pops up and that's fine, but then I can't get rid of the pop up or I can't get away from the pop up. Like, this isn't good. <laughs> this isn't helpful. Right. <laughs> it's totally defeated the purpose of your website because now I'm leaving because exactly. I could not get past the pop up. For like, right. you, you could have had like wonderful that. things to share, and, and we've got distracted and pulled away from that yeah and I think it communicates a level of trust to our readers too when you have a user-friendly place you want them to feel at home you want to create a hospitable place and that's a way of communicating love and kindness to your reader when you're doing things like making the text easier to read making the website pleasant on the eyes and easy to use and navigate it's a way we love our reader with the truth and the beauty and the goodness. Because if we neglect all those things and say, all that matters is I'm writing perfect words, but nobody can really get to those perfect words or they're too distracted by all the loud things happening around them on the website, the purpose has been defeated. Yes, I totally, I totally agree. So, you know, one of, one of the things that you, I think, are most well known for is just your keen editorial eye. <laughs> um, and you're just, I mean, Jana calls you the goat of editing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so how does that, how does that play into all of this as well? As 
writers, we need to be such careful, careful editors. We need to have eyes to see. And it is hard. And that's why we need extra sets of eyes. Because when we, especially when you've read that piece for the 20th time, you're not only ready to be done with it because you're so sick of those words, but also you know what you mean. I know exactly what I was intending to communicate with that sentence. But then somebody else comes along and reads it and they're like, I have no idea what you're trying to say here. Or because I'm Canadian, they point out, is this some kind of Canadian phrase? Because I have no <laughs> idea what that word is. <laughs> and so it does matter. And we need to make sure that we're getting those extra eyes, especially on a piece that perhaps deals with a more tricky subject or a piece that requires a lot of nuance we want to make sure we're getting all the eyes we can on it or maybe we're dealing with a difficult passage and we want to make sure you know what am I actually handling this correctly you know as Paul instructs Timothy be found handling the word rightly rightly dividing it and so we want to make sure that we're checking ourselves so when we do talk about a Bible passage even if you've heard this Bible story a million times and you know it by heart Still making that practice of, I'm going to check my trusted commentaries. I might ask my pastor. I'm going to make sure I make this right and clearly. And things like, you know, reading it over and looking for not just grammatical mistakes, but looking for things like, is this written in the active or the passive voice? Is this, you know, making sure that everything makes sense? Is this sentence way too long? that my reader feels like they need to take a breath, even though they're reading it in their head. <laughs> you right. know, we want to yeah. make sure that it isn't a stumbling block. It's a way to graciously take our reader by the hand and lead them through the sometimes treacherous path of being a Christian or of doing the right thing or of understanding God's word, that we're being a helping hand and not stumbling block. I, I love that. I think it elevates it because I think sometimes we can all just kind of groan inwardly when we think about commas and run on sentences and active versus passive, right? Like, I think all of those things can, can feel so like boring and dull and kind of necessary, but not sexy, not fun, right? But, <laughs> you know, it is, it is a way to love our reader and to rightly handle the word of truth. Every little word makes a difference. And sometimes just one change of a preposition can really change the meaning of a whole sentence. And so it, that is exactly of taking care of, of the word, um, rightly dividing it. So, um, so is there like a, a piece of advice? Can you kind of sum up this whole idea of being writers of truth, goodness, and beauty and kind of sum it up for us um, in, in, in an advice um, way to think of the way we approach our writing? I think one of the greatest characteristics we can grow in as believers is discernment. No matter mm -hmm. whether we are writers or not, discernment is so essential. And yet, we oftentimes neglect it. We think, oh, well, I'll let my pastor do that work. I'll let my Bible study leader do that work. I'll let my favorite Christian influencer do that work. But I don't need to discern. I can just, I have my little set of learn from, that's it. I think that's where we can really start to feel, just sit back, whatever words that we're listening to come in and not be discerning. And I think as writers, it's especially important because we don't want to be further wrong teaching that we've mm -hmm. just listened to without discerning it ourselves. We want to be discerning in what we're learning so that what we're teaching is likewise in line with God's word. So that means we need to know again and again, it comes back to knowing God's word, that we have it hidden in our hearts, that we know the truth that we know what God has intended for us. We know the essentials because that's what it comes down to. Not that we have every little secondary and tertiary issue figured out, but rather that we know the essentials and we are established in them so that we can test everything others say and everything we say 
that to make sure we are within the bounds of orthodoxy. And then that also comes to when we're writing, you know, being discerning about what word cho choices am I making? You know, I was listening to something the other day and the way they worded something. I had a friend who she's had many miscarriages and she finds the word miscarried is used very flippantly mm -hmm. that will just say like, oh, and then this, I don't know, they miscarried this word or they miss, like they use it in a very flippant way. And she finds it listen to she finds it hard to hear because it reminds her of her three miscarriages she's had and how awful they were and so like even just being discerning about what kind of language am I using and not that we have to be like and like always looking through our writing fearful that we're going to say something offensive but just having that discerning eye a lot of people say I just want to be able to publish something and not have to worry about it and just well it's my own personal blog this is where all my thoughts are but the reality is when we're publishing something online we do have to care if you want to write something without having to worry about editing and just say whatever you want that's what your journal is for that's what the ripped up envelope in the garbage is for <laughs> that's right do that but when we're writing online even if you think I have such a small following it doesn't matter it still does. Every one person matters. And we want to be careful with these words that we're publishing. Because when we aren't, people do get heard. Even if it's just, you know, that small blogger in the corner of the internet. We can still say harmful things. And we need to be so careful with the words we choose. And if we don't, if we're unsure, we're like, I don't know, maybe there is something off with this piece. It's better to wait on it. It's better for the content calendar to get messed up a bit piece that you're unsure about and wait on those words and like, you know what I'd rather spend the time dwelling on this myself or waiting to get the extra pair of eyes on it than publish something that could lead somebody astray or even hurt somebody who's already deeply hurting yeah so that's so good and such a needed thing like um you know it's not necessarily about I mean it is it is getting better at the craft right but really what we're talking about is being spirit led and being spirit filled in our our day to day work and in in the words that we publish. Um, you know, they say the internet is forever, right? But at the same time, like we can't be so fearful that we don't try and that we also evolve and we go back and we see old things that we've written. We're like, oh, I don't know that I. I handled that. I mean, we're not called to be perfect, right? We're called exactly. to just walk worthy and, and to do that with, um, with some just spirit dependency. Like we just need grace, right? We just need a lot of grace and we're not perfect. Um, but the heart that the intent is that we want to honor the Lord. I, um, I read this quote this morning by John Piper. It says, he said that Christ is most or I, he said, Christ is most praised when he is our prize. And I just mm -hmm. thought that was such a good thing um, just to think about today is just, is he your prize? If he is your prize, then he is being praised, right? In the, in the way that you put your words out there into the world. So we need a lot of grace. We need a lot of the spirit's help to, to be discerning. Um, what well, you said what about like, having grace about, sorry to interrupt, what you were saying though, oh, about having grace for ourselves, that's part of embodying the truth and the goodness. Because when we can recognize and say, you know what, I didn't, the honest truth is I didn't communicate or handle the truth rightly in this post. And so I'm going to be honest with you as my reader and say, I messed up here. And the goodness of being able to say, I'm sorry, forgive me. And I think that, like, I think we, we sometimes think, oh, I failed because I said this wrong thing. It's important that we're able to have the humility and the grace to say when we have messed up rather than just trying to sweep it under the rug and pretend it didn't happen. Just delete the post. Forget it ever happened. Ignore the emails that come in or the comments that multiply on our social media. Instead, being able to say, you know what? Here it is. It was wrong and I'm sorry. And that's where truth, goodness, and beauty can again grow from even something where we got it wrong. 
for, yeah, that's, that's so important as well. So um, what are you going to talk to us about on Thursday in your solo teaching? Yeah, I hope to, I want to go through each of these specific of truth, goodness, and beauty, really define them and get into what they mean. And then what the practical outworking of each one looks like in our writing, and then give you some tools to go and implement this in your writing. Awesome. That would be great. We're looking forward to that. So um, I just wanted to open this up to you all who are who are on the call with us, if you have any comments or questions for Lara. Unmute. Does this idea of truth, goodness, and beauty resonate with you all? I would I would think that it would. Um, you all were attracted to the the art and heart of writing, but how did it, do you all think about this often in your own writing practice? Or is this like an, oh yeah, like I need to think about that more <laughs> moment. <laughs> I have a question. Um, I just subscribed to you, Laura, to your Substack, And I think I got one this morning and I'm already just loving the way you write and communicate. Um, so I find myself struggling with, I just came upon the phrase purple prose. I think somebody, Rachel, maybe talked about it. Was it. Rachel, um, yeah. And right, yeah, and I'm like, I'm always drawn to that. You know, I love the way Ann Voskamp writes. I love some of that really flowy style of writing. And to me, that's beautiful. And then I've heard several people recently talk about purple prose, stay away from that, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> You know, that what if that's who you are? And, and I mean, I know you don't want to go over the top because you don't want to bring the attention to yourself. But how do you do that in a way that honors God to use beautiful, flowy, maybe not typical expected phrasing to draw glory to God? How do you find the balance between that? First, thank you for your kind words about my writing. Um, that's really sweet. And yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. And first, I think there is definitely a preference out there. Like I've heard, especially with Anne Voskamp, I've heard some people say her writing just speaks to my soul. And other people are like, I cannot stand another second because it takes too long to read. <laughs> and so for one, I think there is there's a preference. And at the end of the day, if a reader doesn't like the way we write, subscribe right? We don't want somebody who's following our writing who can't stand our writing. Like, we don't want to put them through that. And <laughs> uh, they aren't going to support our writing in the end. And so for one, there is a preference thing. And that's okay. People will have preferences. And then also, I think there is a point where you were kind of hinting at this, where rewriting, if it's too much, it can almost become a distraction and encumbering to our reader. Actually, one time when I was working on a novel and I sent it to an editor and I, it was a both a high moment and a low moment. She said, your descriptions are so beautiful. And I was like, oh, my goodness. And she's like, but there's so much description that I completely missed what was going on because I had distracted her. I got lost for it, so to speak, like while I was spending so much time describing the scenery and all the setting and what everybody looks like. She completely missed the little nuance point that I was trying to draw out in that scene. And so when she got to this climactic point in the book, she said, I didn't realize everything was into this. And when I showed her afterwards, well, I dropped this hint and this hint and this hint. She's like, I missed all of that. I don't even remember those because I was so lost in your description. And I think that can happen whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction. If we are just going around and around and around in these circles of flowery prose, but we're never actually really trying to bring out that point for our reader. And I get that, like, yes, creative writing, I do it myself. It's sometimes it's about going around and around that point and letting your reader kind of find the message in your story. But there's also a point when we can overdo it that it's for our reader to find that nugget and to find that truth that we've implemented into our writing. And so it is a balance and it's also knowing our reader 
and also knowing where we're going, like in recognizing if this is the kind of writing I want to do, then I also need to make sure I'm putting myself in front of those kinds of readers because I don't want to trick people into thinking, oh, this is the kind of writing that I'm going to be getting. But then they find out we're one of those flowery people they can't stand <laughs> and they're mad that they subscribed. Yeah, that's such a good question, Cheryl. I've been thinking about that too. And I, I think it is, there is an element of like, is, is it true to you, right? Um, sometimes I think we can, I think it was Ronnie Rock who said, don't try and be an Anne. Don't try and be um, an Anne Lamont and um, an Anne Boskamp, right? Like be Cheryl. <laughs> is this how Cheryl sounds? You know, but I, I appreciate that too. I love that idea of purple, purple prose. <laughs> Carrie said she loves this concept and it really is how I try and speak and write, but I've not thought about it in terms of writing. So thanks, Carrie, for that. I think that's really good. Any other comments or questions for Lara? Of how you um how you wove together the truth beauty I'm getting it wrong truth beauty and goodness not just in our writing but just how we approach the the words on the page like the font and the pop ups and like the practical aspects of it I mean so much of it is um, how we write, but then there's the practical aspects of it. And so sometimes when we hear um, conversations like this, it can be a little um, hard to have a takeaway with. But then when I hear, when I heard you talk about, okay, practically, you know, is the font easy to read? And is my website welcoming? I'm like, Oh, yeah. I mean, it makes me want to go to my own website and be like, okay, is it welcoming? Is it easy to read? I mean, is it just artistic or is it welcoming to others? Um, I just, anyway, I love the way you talked about that. Yeah, I think, well, it makes me think of a conversation I was actually having with another writer. We were talking about how, you know, we're driving through our local towns sometimes and you'll see this like new business pop up and they had this sign and like, cursive but I'm driving by and like I've driven by that sign 20 times and to this day I still have no idea what it says <laughs> and I think wow they put a lot of work into that sign but not helping me because I have no desire to go there because I have no idea what it even says <laughs> and so it's yeah we want to make sure we're actually clearly communicating and you know maybe that beautiful um, calligraphy font is lovely but if no one can read it, it doesn't serve its purpose. A, um, first got my logo done. I remember I told the designer, I said, I love the way you do calligraphy and I want you to make a fully, like, I just want you to like handwrite my whole logo. And she said to me, now I know you're the client. You get to decide at the end of the day what you do. She said, but from my perspective, she's like, you do have a difficult name. And she's like, probably not be able to read it. She's like, it's one thing for Pepsi to do a calligraphy <laughs> font. We all can recognize the word Pepsi. It's another thing for you with a very different and unique la French name and a unique first name to do an entire calligraphy font and nobody can read it. And so she's like, you want, in order for the logo to be memorable and to represent you, people need to be able to understand it. Yeah, it's kind of the scales that we talked about earlier, right? Where the beauty might over might outweigh the goodness of it, right? Because it's not recognizable or something like that. Um, and so keeping those things and that that tension and that balance is is an important thing. And it's not always like we don't always know what that is, right? And so mm -hmm. having each other extra eyes on words and logos. <laughs> matter yes <laughs> right people can see things we can't see exactly any 
Any other thoughts? Well, Lara, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, just a reminder, she's gonna teach how to write with truth, goodness, and beauty on Thursday. Um, Lara, I have it at 12.30, is that correct? Well, my time. I have time. it at 4.30 my time. Okay, yeah, so we're on the half hour, everyone. So just be sure you check your own time zone on that and um, feel free to um, pop in, have questions, write, ask your questions in the block. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all again on Thursday. I can't wait. Thanks so much for coming. All right, good night or goodbye everyone. Have a good day. <laughs>